very excited today to introduce my dad, um, John Charles Bober, who is the Dean of the University of North Carolina's Law School right now. But most of the time when I was growing up, he was a practicing civil rights lawyer uh, for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which should be familiar to those of you doing the Brown case. Um, and he worked on a number of civil rights cases that went to the Supreme Court. So, since you all have spent, what, four or five weeks now on this classic Baldwin project, eighth grade Supreme Court project, it seemed like a good time to bring him in. And I know a couple of the classes, we've already had some Q&A this morning about how the judicial system works, um, what the Supreme Court does. I think now he's gonna talk a little bit more um, about his actual experience arguing in front of the court and what that's actually like as well as some of his cases. So I will just turn it over. Um, you all, as you do so well, are always free to ask questions. I want to begin by thanking my daughter for that uh, introduction, but also by uh, underscoring what she said, that I had a great time this morning with two of your classes uh, with people asking and answering questions. So I'm, I'm gonna talk, and uh, I'm a lawyer, so I'm just, likely to keep on going if nobody raises their hand, but you should raise your hand and ask me questions uh, as, as I go. As Gretchen, Dr. Bogert said, uh, all of you have experience now of spending four or five weeks researching an important decision of the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court, as you know, sits in Washington. How many people have ever been there physically? About a quarter to a third of you. There's this big, beautiful marble building at 1 First Street Northeast. That's the address of the court. It was built in the 1930s. You can go up these huge marble steps. It's a big sort of freeze at the top says equal justice under law. And in you come. Did those of you raise your hands go just to tour or did any of you all actually hear the court in argument? Anybody? You are able to go down and line up and go into the court when the court actually issues a, a decision or when the court hears from the lawyers in the case. Uh, I've been very lucky in my career, as you heard my daughter say, because I worked with a public uh, interest organization, and part of my job back in the pre-internet era was being the person that knew my field as well as anybody in the country. So the people would call me about capital punishment defense cases, because that's what I was doing, representing men typically under sentence of death who were trying to avoid execution. And so every time there was a Supreme Court decision uh, that was coming up, I would go down and listen to the arguments so that I could say to somebody who called me from Texas or from California, this is what the court is thinking. And it was before the OES project, now you can all go online, there was no online then, and, and hear the oral arguments of these cases. But that was, that was my job. And then I was lucky for four different occasions to, to go myself and, and, and give an argument in the court. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how all of that works. Um, we, we, we mentioned this morning that some of you are good enough to have this word in your vocabulary already, the role of certiorari. Supreme Court is, in a sense, the Super Bowl. It's the place that, that, that uh, unhappy parties in a lawsuit want to go if they have some reason. They've lost below, they may have lost at the trial court, they may have lost at some intermediate court. They want justice. And the Supreme Court is the place they hope will get it. Well, the Supreme Court gets about five or 6,000 requests a year to hear oral argument and decide the cases. Does anybody have any idea about how many cases get heard every year? Yes. Please, you. Oh, 2%. Yeah, 2%. I, I can't do the math as well as you, but like 70 out of 5,000. So that's, that's probably right. Yes, 2% is probably right, meaning most of the cases don't get heard. What is the court doing when it takes those other 98 and says, no, we're not going to hear you? It's normally not a decision by the court about whether the party is ju uh, justly or unjustly accused or convicted or whether the right plaintiff or defendant lost. The court decides to take a case for other reasons. Usually it's because there are different opinions being rendered in different lower courts on the same issue. 
And so in California and Idaho, they're saying one thing about the health care law. In Connecticut and Massachusetts, they're saying another thing. It's the same law. And the Supreme Court says, we've got to get it straight. We've got to have one rule at all the time. On the, on the other hand, sometimes what happens is, is the court says, this is an important enough issue. Think of affordable health care. Is it going to be provided or not? Will the federal statute go forward? Where it says, even if there's no disagreements yet among the lower courts, we've got to reach out and decide it. The court has a very odd rule for how it votes on whether it hears a case. There are nine justices on the court. How many does it take to, would you guess, to, to win in the court? Five. Five. How many do you think it should take then to, to have the court agree to hear the case? Five. You'd nine. think so. Nine. 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 No. No, if it won, we would have probably a thousand cases. Nine. Nine. Eight. Four. four. So-called rule of four. If four justices say we want to hear it, it will be heard. That's kind of an odd thing if the other ones don't want to hear it. But, but, but uh, I could do a whole 30 minutes on how the court itself decides whether they want to hear it. If, if you know that five people oppose your point of view and will likely rule against you, you may not vote to hear the case, even if you think the case is wrongly decided. Because when the court takes it, you know that five people are going to disagree with you. So often the court sort of looks and says, do we think we have a chance to win this? If we do, we'll vote for it, et cetera. All we know is we file what are called petitions for certiorari. And I want to show you physically what one of those looks like. In a case called McCleskey versus Kemp that I did, which is a case by a petitioner in pauperous, in other words, a poor person, where you didn't have to print the brief. You could submit the document just basically having typed it up. This is what it is. I'll send it around so people want to take a look at it. And, and what it does is say, court, please take my case. Here's why. Now, I've just told you that the court doesn't simply sit to decide that wrong has been done and it needs to be righted. And so what you wind up doing in the petition is saying, let me explain to you why this is a very important issue. Let me explain to you how much good you would do, court, if you took this. And the other side gets up and writes its response to it, saying something like, this is not a very important case, or even if it's an important issue, this is a weird defendant. You don't want a case with this particular party in it. You want something else. And so you fire back and forth those papers. And then the court gathers in its conference room, and the justices go around, and they say on 65-32-41, whatever the number of the case is, how many people are for certiorari and how many people are against? And once, once four hands go up, the court knows it's a case that's going to be heard. Once they've decided to do that, the clerk of the court, who's the administrative party, gives you a call and says, Ms. Roger, the court's just granted certiorari in McLeod versus Kim. At that point, depending on whether you're the party that asked the court for relief, so called a petitioner, or the party that was happy with what happened below, the party who asked the court for relief has 45 days to write a brief. Now, have anybody looked at a brief at all? I've got a brief here in the same case. A brief is not brief. A brief is long. A brief is 50 pages. Uh, they now have actually a word count. You couldn't do word counts in the old days, but now you can. And a brief in the Supreme Court is, is a very different creature than it is in a lower court. For the following reasons, in a lower court, it's usually enough to say, this case was decided wrongly. The Supreme Court said so in Jones versus Smith, and we are under Jones versus Smith. Why can't you do that in the Supreme Court itself? Anybody with an idea? In other words, you can use precedent in the lower court to say the Supreme Court has said you've got to do it this way, and they didn't do it this way. Yes? Well, each state may have its own laws. When you get to the Supreme Court, it's only going to decide matters that every state has to go by. They're either going to be constitutional principles or some statutory principles. No, the answer is that you're telling the court itself, we want you to decide this matter. 
And it's not enough to say, you said something earlier and that resolves it. The court can make its own choices. Think about the cases you've got. Was Brown versus Board of Education clearly ready to come out Brown's way under Plessy? No. Plessy had been the law, and you're going to tell the court you need to change what you're doing. You need to alter your point of view. So you write those briefs, and, and when you're writing them, just two or three things on it. It's important, we were always taught as lawyers, key importance to lay out the facts in such a way that no matter what the legal issue, when the court reads the story, they say, boy, that's a moving story. Your client deserves relief. And actually, the worse the law was for you, the harder it was going to be on the law. The more it was important it was to tell a story so that when you read it, you thought, oh, I hope this party wins. Uh, but that's, yes? Well, I sort of have a random question. Sure. Um, for my case, the Bakke case, in those two lower courts, the Yolo County Court and then the um, Superior Court of California, it goes Bakke versus Regan, and then Bakke versus Regan. But then when it reaches the Supreme Court, it changes to Regan versus Bakke. Do you know why that is? Well, it, it, I, I don't remember specifically, but what happened was the parties that were litigating the case that was litigated in the Superior Court were the ones who lost. And they were the ones who 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 were the ones who
heavy-handedness, Justice Kennedy agreed, yes, I, I did say that, didn't I? I did think that, didn't I? And so you're trying to work Justice Kennedy so that you'll think, of course, the other side comes in and says, Justice Kennedy, of course, wrote in the so-and-so case, and they find all the things that he said that would seem to take you in the other direction. And so you begin to try to shape your arguments for the court. Now, the pretty part about litigation, and we talked about this this morning, is it's always in the context of an actual case. And so affirmative action in higher education, the only parties that appear to argue in front of the court are Ms. Fisher's lawyers, Abigail Fisher's, and the state of Texas's lawyers, because that's the place she tried to get into as an undergraduate and did. But we in North Carolina, and Harvard and Yale and Princeton and other schools say we have a whole lot of concern about the outcome of this case too. Because if they hold you can't use race in higher education to admit people as one of the factors, that will affect us as well. You know what parties do when they have that kind of interest in a case, but they don't have the right to 30 minutes in front of the court. Anybody heard of Amicus Curiae? Do you know what I'm even talking about? Yes. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. So groups will get together like universities in that matter, or the American Psychological Association, or the NRA if it's a gun case, and say, we weren't a party below, but we want you justices to hear what we've got to add to the case before it's decided. And the court has a funny little system. The petitioners, the parties appealing, their briefs are all, I wish I'd brought them, a pale blue, a sort of Carolina blue color, if you know the colors of the University of North Carolina. The respondents' briefs are all red. The amicus curiae briefs are all green, the color of your blouse. In effect, you're, you're an amicus curiae out there, and you're, you're a respondent. I don't see anybody who's a petitioner in this. So the court actually says, we can just look literally at the cover of the case and know which, which side the party is on. Well, let me talk about what it's like to actually get. Can you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, there it is, right in front of me. Um, I'm just curious, because when we went to the Constitution Center, they were talking about how in a normal, like a district court, I guess, if you were, if the jury was biased, you would have to go to the Supreme Court. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Different states have different rules on how many jurors, when they're deciding cases, you have to have in order to prevail and one side come out. If it's a criminal case, most states say it's got to be unanimous. If even one juror out of 12 holds out, or in some cases, states, you have six people on a jury. If even one holds out, it's a mistrial. And that's, that's really built into the system so that we can be sure that those who are guilty are guilty. We'd rather have an innocent man go free, the old saying is. The, 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 excuse me. I never saying the, no, a guilty man go free than, than have a, a dozen innocent men. I'm getting it backwards. Here. It doesn't have been convicted. And so we, we'd rather make an error on the side of letting people go. So we say it's got to be really hard for the state. The state has to have all 12 or all 10. Sometimes in matters that are civil, not criminal cases, <coughs> states will say it can be a 10 to 2 verdict or an 8 to 4 verdict. Uh, as long as it's a majority verdict, one way will accept it. And, and the Supreme Court has been asked to step in sometimes to say, are there limits on what the state can do about that? When it gets to the higher level, we're not talking about jurors. There's nobody except the court to hear it. And we aren't really talking about new evidence. Nobody puts in new evidence in the Supreme Court. All you do is take all the evidence below and say, let's look at it and decide based on what we've got. Yes? Um, how you said that you can get like, different justices to like, see your side by like, sending them something or like, writing something up. Could you possibly persuade a justice to not vote on the case? <laughs> Like, not like to try and or like pressure him so much that he just like says, you know what, I don't want to do this. Like, not that well, they're not quite that crude. Uh, uh, and actually, you don't write Justice Kennedy. 
you write the brief, and you just quote a lot of Justice Kennedy in the brief. So that's the way you get to Justice Kennedy. You can move to what's called recuse a justice. You can say, I think you have such a bias or prejudice in this case, or appear to have such, that you ought not sit. Now, Justice Kagan is not sitting in the Fisher case. <coughs> Justice Kagan was in the United States Solicitor General's office at a time when an earlier part of this case went on, and the Solicitor General's office in the United States had taken a position on the case. So she says, I'm not going to sit, because it's already clear that I've taken a position in this matter. If you move to the accused of justice, it's a very dangerous thing. If the justice agrees with you, they don't sit. But if they disagree with you, not only do they sit, but you've told them, I think you're biased and prejudiced and can't be fair. And it's very, very easy for them to start to not like you, you know, before you get up. You've already said, I don't think you'd be a fair justice in this case. So, Lawyers think long and hard about whether they move to recuse somebody, and, and, and rarely do, and it rarely works, even when they do. But let me tell you about what happens when you actually come to the oral argument. I remember uh, coming up the day before, actually two days before, to listen to the court. Because part of what you want to do is to hear the justices, what kind of mood they're in, who's, who's acting, who's not. Are they grumpy with somebody, et cetera? And so you'll sit in the courtroom for a day ahead and watch the justices and say, oh, it looks like to me Scalia's particularly grumpy. You know, I've got to be careful about him. Or somebody else doesn't seem to be hearing very well. Justice Powell doesn't seem to be. And so you're really kind of getting ready. It's like a game. It's like a game that you're going to play. And like a big game that you're going to play, you get nervous. Golly, do you get nervous. I was just absolutely uh, uh, full of shivers the day before. And I was going to get a good night's sleep at a hotel uh, from McCleskey, and, and my daughter and my son decided to come down with my wife to hear the argument. And we said, we'll get two hotel rooms so I can get a good sleep. We'll have one for them. How old were you? This was 80, 11. And so Peter was eight. And so we will, uh, I will have you know, plenty of good sleep and get up the next morning. Well, about 12.30 at night, we get a knock on our door, and Peter, my son, comes and says, I'm scared. I can't sleep. Can we move to your room? We said, okay, come on in. Well, the rest of the night was like being in a washing machine. They were just going on and on and on. And I got about three hours of sleep that night. It was really one of the least sleep that I'd gotten any time in the last month. And you go to the court early in the morning. All the, all the lawyers are supposed to be there by, uh, I think, 8.45, which is an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes before the, the court opens. And you go into the clerk's office. And the clerk of the Supreme Court's a pretty big deal. And he sits all the lawyers down and says, now here's what's going to be the rules this morning. You two are the first argument. We want you at this council table. And you're the lawyers on the other side. And you'll be at this council table. And you two are doing the next argument at 11 o'clock. And here's where we want you. And you're the lawyers on the other side. And here's where we want you. And you go in and you sit down. And interestingly enough, there at the table, and believe me, I'm further away now from you in the third row than the lawyers would be to the court itself. You're right there. Indeed, it's really more like if I'm at the lectern, the second row is where the court is. It's that close. And you, you're there, but, but before you're there, you're sitting at the table, and you notice this little white thing. You go, what is that? And you pick it up, and it's a feather. You know what the feather is there for? Not a symbol at all. <laughs> that's a bad. That's a bad guess. Whatever that was over there. It's 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 a quill pen from the old days in the 19th century where lawyers said there's no longer any ink in the inkwell, but there is an inkwell and there's a pen. And now, of course, it's it's primarily just a souvenir. You take it back and you say, I've got my feather from the Supreme Court. Well, then at 10 o'clock sharp, everybody's sitting there quiet. It's not as big a room front to back as this room is. So all the rest of the people are sitting there. It's usually packed. There's a series of blue curtains. And here's the, here's the bench. And there's this buzz like that. And all of a sudden, from behind the curtain, here come the night justices. Boom, up to their seats. And there's somebody who puts them in their seats, you know, some assistant like that. And somebody going, oh yes, oh yes, oh, oh 
Philadelphia Business Pro Supreme Court uh, come before them, and now you will be heard, God save the United States in this honorable court, and it sits down. And then the Chief Justice hits the bench like that and says, well, here argument in the first case, counsel, are you ready? And up jumps somebody to speak to the court. It's quite a moment. Uh, and then everybody's supposed to say, when they get up, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. And if you don't do that, it's kind of like you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. That's the may I, if you would, of getting started. And off you go. Now, you've only got 30 minutes, less time than you have in a class period. And you've got a lot to do. One of the things you want to do, we were talking about Justice Kennedy, is if Justice Kennedy's the person you're trying to reach, you want to start an argument that quickly gets Justice Kennedy's interest. You also want to tell him something right at the beginning that makes him feel like, oh, you're a poor client. I'll never forget the most powerful opening I ever heard in the court was on the side of a prosecutor. It was a death penalty case, and the prosecutor started out as follows. At 7.30 in the morning on Lake Powell, the morning of the 14th of September, a rowboat pushed out from shore. In the boat was the defendant, and in the boat was a bag with the still live victim in this case, tied inside the burlap bag. They rowed out 300 yards to where the lake was 500 feet deep. They picked the defendant up, they tossed him over the side of the rowboat, and down, 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 the victim went into Lake Powell. Well, at that point, the entire court is thinking about what it would be like to be a victim in a bag dying of drowning. And I thought, I don't know what this case is about, but the state is going to win this case because it was such a powerful image, and the state did win the case. So you're trying to find that usually is not anything that strong at the very beginning to get the court's attention. On the other hand, the court can do whatever it wants. How many of y'all have read or listened to anybody argue any of your cases? Uh, good, so many of you. Did they let them alone? Not at all. The court just jumps right in. And the hard part for you as a lawyer is that you don't know what they're going to ask you, and you don't know, therefore, what exactly you're going to say. On the other hand, it's one of the most important times of the whole case, because if, if somebody asks you a question, they're really telling you, I'm not persuaded yet by what you're trying to tell me. Help me find a way to rule for you. And so the two minutes after they ask you is the moment when you, and then you can, you can look at their face. It's all like looking at the student's face, and sometimes you can get the student to understand what you're saying, and sometimes you can't. But you go all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I don't have this justice. What can I do? And then all of a sudden, when you're trying to do what you, your best you can, somebody from the other side says, counsel, counsel, excuse me, can I ask you another question? And if they do it two or three times and they're all hostile questions, you've got yourself into a jam. Yes? Um, who talks first? Like, which side of the argument? You're, you're appealing the party. The party that says, I've got an appeal first, which is a very, very interesting point. If you're going first, you've got the advantage of, of shaping the court's mind. On the other hand, what's the advantage of going second? You can break what the other people say. Yeah. Your Honor, I, I just heard my uh, beloved uh, you know, comrade here say X and Y and Z. I want to point out the three reasons why that actually doesn't work. Or, I never did that before. Your, your Honor, you ask if you can even get up and say, Justice Powell, you ask a question halfway through this argument. I want to begin my argument by speaking to that question. So you've got that advantage. On the other hand, you sit there with these notes that you've prepared for six months, and all of a sudden you get about 10 minutes through your argument, the other person's argument, and go, they don't buy that argument, they don't buy this, et cetera, and what you thought was your outline has just completely changed. And sometimes, though, the, the, the justice is not pointing to you with a question because they want to find out what you think. What else could they be doing? Yes? Trying to get you to convince the other people and ask the questions that will meet the other Very people. Very good. Sometimes, or sometimes they're saying, I want you to persuade other justices who I know aren't on your side, having read your briefs. Here's a friendly question to help you get this justice to see the point I've made. But it can be worse than that. 
Sometimes they can say, voter, I don't agree with what you're arguing at all. I want to take 10 of your minutes or 15 of your minutes on the very worst and hardest part of your case. So if you don't get to say the good things you wanted to say, because you're struggling with Justice Scalia, who's trying to kind of grab you and, and keep you like held underwater. It's like somebody who's swimming, and the justice takes you down under water and says, I don't want to let you up. And so you practice these ways of saying things like, Justice Scalia, that's a very interesting point, but this is really not exactly uh, what this case is about. It's on really different facts. So Justice Scalia, even if I concede your point, there are other points at which I think I could win. You're trying to get away from the grip of the justice who's trying to do that to you so that you can get back to the, to the good parts of, of your, your argument. Uh, and then occasionally the opening party, the party who is the first to speak, can reserve some time if she or he wants. They can say, Your Honor, I only want to talk for 25 minutes, and I want to reserve the five minutes. Now, why would you do that? Exactly. I mean, frankly, the advantage of going first is you get to shape the court's view of the case. But the disadvantage is you don't know what the other side's going to say. So if the other side says something, in fact, that happened to me once, and they said something, I thought, that's just wrong. I know from the transcript of the trial that that's wrong. You have people sitting beside you and you say, get the page, you know, volume four of the transcript, page 361, and you stand up and say, Your Honor, counsel has just said X. I direct your attention to page 341 of part four of the transcript, quote, 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 quote. Your Honor, that decisively proves what the other side said is wrong. Now those times are few and far between, but, but that's, that's what you say before. You don't want to have no possible chance to respond. But then what about the other part? When he hears that, doesn't she or he want to come back? And that's where the court just says, no, no, no. We're just not going to let this go on forever. One opportunity for the opening, one response, one reply, and then the court goes to decide. Have you all read anything about how courts actually do the decision-making process? It's very interesting. The court goes into a little chamber, a little conference room, and all nine justices are there. And they usually meet on a Friday, and they say, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna make tentative votes about the cases we've just heard this week. And we'll start with the junior most justice on the McCleskey case. Where are you coming out of the McCleskey case? If you're the junior most justice, the justice, not the youngest, but the one who's just going to court. And you would say, I'm for granting relief. And the other would say, I'm for denying relief. And they can talk as little or as long as they want. And the chief justice, who really presides at this conference, keeps a count. And he says, it looks like there are six people for reversing, it looks like there are three people for affirming. And then the rule is that the oldest justice in the majority side gets to pick who writes the opinion. And the chief justice always counts as the oldest. Now, now let, me, let me tell you one interesting thing about how that works. If the case is very close, and most of the cases that you all have looked at, some are 9-0, but some are very close. Think of Baki, yes. And I'm the Chief Justice, Warren Berger, at the time. And the case is really close. Who do, and I'm in the majority. Who do I want to give the, the, the writing assignment to? The person who has the most time? What do you think? But I've got five people who may agree with the majority. Um, I don't know. Someone who's not sure. The person who's the least sure, but is sort of on your side. Why? Because then they'll decide while they write. That's right. And it's rare to have somebody write an opinion and say, I don't agree with that opinion that I've just written. So often what you'll do is look for the person who's the weak link and say, why don't you write it? So I know I've got your vote nailed down. But sometimes the justices will start to write the opinion and get halfway through and realize there's a problem I didn't see in this case. And they'll get back together and they'll say, I'm changing my vote. And so it's not as simple as simply raising their hands at that first conference. 
And indeed, sometimes they'll write a draft. And the way the court works, they'll write an opinion and circulate it to all the other justices in the court. It used to be they printed it back before word processing. They literally had a printing office in the basement, and they would print out like a book all the, the opinion and then circulate it around. And back would come a note. Justice Scalia would say, I'll join your opinion if you take out the paragraph that says this, or if you'll add a paragraph that says that. And it's sort of horse trading. And you may say, well, I like the opinion the way I wrote it, and I don't agree with Justice Scalia. But if Justice Scalia is not there, I don't have five votes. Do I agree to leave this opinion unchanged and in effect lose the ability to write it? Or do I let Justice Scalia's footnote or paragraph come in, which may change the law a little bit? So when you all are reading opinions in these cases, particularly the ones that are very, very close, often what you read is not what any justice personally thought, but is the product of a, like a give and take with the court. And, and the very shrewdest lawyers trying to decide where the court will go next will say, I know you said this, but I'll bet it's partly because you're trying to get the vote of that person, so I think I've actually got a good chance with you on something that's coming up later this, that, 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 that might otherwise seem at, at variance with that. I'm going to talk if I've got, I've got 15 minutes. Yeah, 10, 10. About the, the case that I did that was probably the most significant Supreme Court case I had, we represented a person named Warren McCluskey. Warren McCluskey uh, had been convicted of a, an armed robbery and the murder of a deputy sheriff, or excuse me, a police officer, not a deputy sheriff, in the city of Atlanta. He was one of four defendants who had gone into a furniture store clearly intending to rob it and somebody had shot the police officer as he came in to stop the robbery. There was a disagreement about which one of the four it was, but uh, somebody testified against McCleskey, it was the other most likely person to have done it. And he said, I didn't do it, McCleskey did it, and I'll testify for you. And so the case uh, was tried and, and he was convicted. He was given a death sentence. The death sentence was appealed, a while went by. We were in the process of legal defense plan of doing a study of how the death penalty had been carried out in the state of Georgia. And what we found, looking at an eight year period from 1973 through 1980, was that in Georgia, whether or not you got the death sentence depended in very, very substantial part on the race of both the victim and of the defendant. If the defendant person committed, uh, accused of the crime was African American, and the victim was white, one out of five, 22% of those people received a death sentence. If the, vic the victim was white and the defendant was white, 11% of those people received the death sentence. On the other hand, if the victim was black and the defendant was white, Less than 3% of those people received the death sentence. And that was, that was interesting initial statistics, but the state took the position, well, those are very, very different kinds of crimes. So the study went on, a massive study, to look at lots of factors, hundreds of factors about the case. And so it would say, we want to look at 7-Eleven robberies, where somebody came into 7-Eleven stores, and the clerk was standing there, and they took the clerk and killed the clerk, and rob the store. Very much the same kind of facts. Is there any difference if the clerk happened to be black or the clerk happened to be white? And lo and behold, the evidence shows there was. And there was enough difference, the statistical experts said this is problematic. So that's the case we took to the courts. And we put all the evidence in, we lost in the district court, we lost in the Court of Appeals, and we came to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, it was a very, very hard case because it was hard to get past the facts. Justice Powell asked me, in fact, I remember, Mr. Voter, Mr. Voter, what were the facts of this case? I said, Your Honor, Mr. McCleskey is alleged to have shot and killed a police officer during the course of an armed robbery. But then I was able to say, in that very county, Your Honor, which was Atlanta, Fulton County, there have been 17 police officer killings in the period we studied. 
during that seven years. 11 of the seven had involved police officer killings during an armed robbery or burglary or something else. Of those, only two had even gone to a jury over whether death was appropriate. In one case, the police officer killed was black and the outcome was life. In Mr. McCleskey's case, the defendant was black and the police officer was white and the death case. So your honor, murder is a terrible crime. Murder a police officer even more so in the course of an armed robbery. But in the state of Georgia and the county of Fulton, only one out of 17 people received a death sentence and it fits our, our, our data. Well, the court um, split five to four. Justice Powell wrote the opinion. Justice Powell sort of said, unless you can show me specifically that this jury engaged in racial discrimination, uh, we're going to uphold the case. And indeed, we forbid you to ask the jurors what they did. That would be, that would be illegal. So you go, well, exactly how do we get the jury's views if you tell us we can't get the jury's views. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, and it's a, it's a, it is a very long story, Ms. McCleskey came back to the Supreme Court on another occasion, on another issue, and was told to be executed. About five years later, in retirement, Justice Powell was asked about his career, and he decided, Baki and some other cases, is there any case that you regret having decided the way you did? And he said, Mr. McCleskey's case is the one case that I regret. Uh, and uh, of course, it was too late for Mr. McCleskey at that point, and too late for the whole issue. Uh, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about how a case like that works, because it's very much not an ordinary sort of case. In fact, it's one of the things that trouble the court. What do we know about statistics? We're not sure about this. And you say, well, it's new statistics in a whole lot of other areas. Yes. Well, how, I was talking to Dr. Walker, and she said how most of the cases that go into the Supreme Court are more constitutional issues. How is this a constitutional issue? It's a great question. How is this a constitutional issue? We had two bases. One basis was that the, the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. And the court had held earlier that putting somebody to death in circumstances that were what they call capricious or arbitrary, just for no particular reason at all, was cruel and unusual punishment. And we said, here we've got a situation in which if there are 20 of you who've committed roughly the same crime, we're putting three of you to death because of who your victims, what your victim's race was. That's capricious. And we also said it violates the Equal Protection Clause. All victims should be treated equally, all defendants should be treated equally. So that was, that was an argument. Is it some good or bad to you? Bad. <laughs> yeah, bad, bad. I've got one quote I've got to pick up here, yes. Um, if the Supreme Court hadn't Yeah, exactly. It's a very good question. And I was actually surprised. Frankly, we didn't know what we'd find out. I went to a, a social scientist with people who worked with me, and we said to him, you're one of the great people in the country doing this work. You've never looked at this issue. We will give you a quarter of a million dollars to do this issue. If it turns out, once you've done the study, that there's no discrimination, you can, you can write any paper you want to. On the other hand, our deal is, if it turns out there is discrimination, we want you to testify for us. And he said, I think I've just taken your quarter million dollars because I don't think there is any discrimination. And we said, you're the best kind of witness we could have because you come into it not thinking there's discrimination, but thinking the opposite. And yet you'll call it like an umpire the way you see it. And he came out of the study and said, I'm just blown away. I can't, this is stronger than the evidence. He said, in Georgia, if you had committed a prior murder and had now committed your second murder, you're less likely to get death than if you're a black person who's killed a white person the first time. The odds are higher. So he said, I'm just really, really, very really impressed with all that. All that said, if the court had said, deny, we're not going to hear it, it would have just gone away. So this is sort of all but you were talking about like um, the people who write for the majority. Right. I was I Miranda versus Arizona, so it was five four. And when I was reading the minority, um, there were like a couple of them. So if people disagree for different reasons, they write multiple of them. Right? That's a great question. Why? I mean, you ask yourself, why would people disagree write different? Yeah, because some of them endorsed each other, and some of them and 
three of them wrote one, and then one of them wrote one by itself? It's a very important question. Let me add its complexity slightly. Sometimes the way you get five votes is that three people will be for a particular view, and two others will say, I don't agree with the reasoning, but I do agree with the outcome, so I'll, I'll join, the opinion, join the judgment. Or I concur, I agree with lots of what you say, but not everything. The court is doing several things there. It's signaling to future courts and future lawyers, don't count on me for, for this part of what the dissent has said. I mean, one of the dissents might say, I really think the states should have their own right to make their own choices about their own criminal law. And the other one said, well, no, I think there actually should be some federal constitutional oversight, but just not of this issue. So this is an issue that the states ought to have lots of room on. Some said the states ought not to have, ought to have room on all their issues. So those are important disagreements. And in a subsequent case, on another issue, you could look and say, oh, Justice Carlin's view on this is different from Justice Stewart's view on this. So I, if they just ruled against, I wouldn't know that. But now I know that I can get Carlin, but not Stewart, or Stewart, but not Carlin. Yes? So um, there's a person who writes the ultimate judgment of the court, which sort of like sums everything up, right? But then there's also people who write individual, like, concurrences or dissents. Right. So there are a bunch of different opinions. Well, you've got the most confused case of the bunch. They have, like, literally 10 different things. It's so confusing. The Bakke case, there is no judgment for the court. There's no opinion for the court. There is no majority. No, he, he writes the opinion, the judgment of the court. The judgment means who wins and who loses. Okay. In his case, in effect, uh, no, no, no. affirmative action can go forward, but Davis has done it wrong, the University of California and Davis. In his case, the four dissenting justices on the right said, we're not even going to get to the constitutional issue. The, the uh, university loses under a statute. Title VI. Yeah. The majority on, excuse me, the dissent on the other, the majority on the other side says we do get to the constitutional issue and Mr. Uh, the, the university should win. And Bakke sort of stands in the middle and says, no, I don't think we should go to the, con the statutory issue. I think we should go to the constitutional issue. So conservatives, I'm with the liberals. But liberals, I disagree with you about what the standard of review is. I think it should be stricter. So the conservatives, in effect, would win. But I disagree with those who say that the university couldn't have had a valid plan if it had done it differently than Davis did. So nobody agreed with all of Powell, but Powell was the roadmap. And for 25 years after, after Bakke, everybody said, go to Justice Powell's opinion. Nobody agreed with it, but you will get five votes for it, whatever you do. Does that? But that you can't get more complex, you can't get more crazy than that. So he was in the middle. Pardon? He was in the middle on he, all he, of the... He was in the middle on all of the issues. Uh, and, and that's why it's, it's not just a numbers game. If there's a legislature, whoever had the most votes wins. But here, it really, it really matters why they voted the way they voted. Now, the, the last thing I'll say, we're almost at the end. The parties are thinking about their cases. The court is thinking long term. There are justices, for example, who think that the states ought to be given lots of freedom. There ought to be lots of so-called federalism power. Those justices are likely to not only be looking at your case in light of its facts, but at what it says to them about federalism. Or they might be big First Amendment opponents or big First Amendment supporters. And they're looking at your case not just about what it says about your facts or even the first minute issues, but about how that's going to fit into 20 years of decisions that they're, they have made and want to make in the future. So you're only a party in a game that's a much longer term game that they're playing. And the extent that you know that, you know, it can help you win your own cases. Now, some people at law school, I'll tell you, there are law, there are law students who listen to constitutional law and say, I'm going the other way. This is the most confused and indeterminate thing I've ever seen. And there are other people kind of like me. I went to divinity school, theology, and all the rest. That's, oh, this sounds very much like that. There are all these things that are kind of real, but kind of indeterminate, and we're arguing about those. And those are the people that wind up being 
usually constitutional lawyers. Anybody here plan to go to law school? Edwards? Yeah. Pretty early? Okay, some of you do. Did you like, uh, did you like this exercise? You, 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 can't, you can't resist. Did you like this exercise? Yeah. Which, which case did you have? Leslie Ferguson. Leslie versus Ferguson. Well, 1896. That was a, it's been overruled, I think. And what about <laughs> Yes. Oh, the prayer case. Yeah, that's very interesting. Of course, these things are still, in one way or another, being fought out. Because the deepest constitutional cases, and I guess this is how I'll close, are about big values in American life. They're always in contest. Religion has been an important part of the American life, and, and, and yet so has having a public sphere in which no one religion can sort of dominate over others. So how you resolve that issue of prayer in the schools. And, and race has plainly been a huge issue in American public life. And in a sense, while Plessy has been overruled, we're back now trying to decide whether it's permissible of a, for a, a student body to be shaped in part by trying to assure that it's racially diverse. With some parties in the Fisher case, like Bakke, saying it's very important to make sure that all the racial and ethnic diversities of the United States are represented. And others saying, if you single out people in part because of their race, you're engaged in racial discrimination. And there's no one right or wrong answer to those questions. Let me stop. Thank you all for your time.